Thanks for listening to Sex with Emily. On today's show, I'm joined by Lewis Howes, host of the School of Greatness podcast and author of the new book, The Mask of Masculinity. This was a really personal discussion about Lewis's pivotal journey. We talk about how men can learn to embrace their vulnerability so they can have healthier relationships, live their fullest lives, and experience greater success both personally and professionally. This episode is also filled with great advice for women to really understand the emotionally challenged men in their lives and how to fully support them. We get into some of your questions on this very topic too. This is a heartfelt episode and I know you'll love it. Enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Look into his eyes. They're the eyes of a man obsessed by sex. Eyes that mock our sacred institutions. Bedroom eyes, they call them in a bygone day. Hey, Emily. You got a boyfriend? Because uh, my man E here, he just got his heart broken. He thinks you're kind of cute. A girl's got to have her standards. Oh, my. The women know about shrinkage. Isn't it common knowledge? What do you mean? Like laundry? It shrinks? Can we not talk about sex so much? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. I feel so good. Being bad feels pretty good. But you know, Emily's not the kind of girl you just play with. You're listening to Sex with Emily. We're talking about sex, relationships, and everything in between. For more information, go to sexwithemily.com. Check out our website. We're updating every day with great content, blogs, videos, everything that you need to have better sex relationships and be a better version of yourself. Because, you know, let's be honest, if you're not having great sex, things sometimes aren't going so great in your life, especially your relationship. So this month, it's still October, and guess what? We are talking about sexy trick-or-treats. I know it's Halloween, Mm. and we want to, you know, we want you guys to make it your own. So if you email me by October, or actually, we're going to give you till November 1st, I want to know your sexiest tricks. Like, is there, you have a go-to move in the bedroom that works for you every single time? Have you mastered, like, multiple orgasms? Um, What is that for you? Like, what is that one thing that you're like, ugh, I got this, or a treat? Is there a favorite rabbit vibrator? Is there something that you need to have in the bedroom? It's like a requirement. I have to wear these sexy underwear because they make me feel the best. Or a lube. You know. You know I talk about the treats. So let me know your sexiest trick or treats by November 1st. Email me feedback at sexwithemily.com. Put Halloween in the subject because we get a lot of emails and you know we're going to give you amazing sexy prizes because that's how we roll. So happy Halloween. Thank you so much. Before I get to my next move here, my next step, I have got a fellow podcaster, author, extraordinary man, Lewis House. Hi, Lewis. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm going to give you everyone your whole rundown in a minute, but I'm going to talk about how important it is. He has a podcast called The School of Greatness, and it is a great, truly a great podcast. And I was just about to talk about how important it is for people to subscribe to podcasts and why that makes a difference it's in really our lives. It's really important. It helps a lot. It helps get the message out there. You have a message that tries to help people live their fullest lives mm-hmm. through sex, through their sexuality, being things like body, that, yeah. you know, being in their body. And if people don't subscribe or share, then it's hard for you to impact more people and really leave a lasting mark on those people. Right. So it's important to subscribe and always share your biggest insight and biggest takeaway from every episode. Every listen to single Emily. one. Exactly. Share it out, email a friend, text a friend, let them know and have them subscribe as well. Exactly. God, you're so hired. That's good. That's Thank you. Um, also, you guys follow me on social media because that's always a good time. It's at Sex with Emily everywhere you go. I am there. I promise. So my guest today is Lewis House. And he's an old friend. It's funny. You walked when did we meet? 2011? 2011. Was that my, when the show was? And my hot sex book launch because you were really into hot sex at the time. That's right. Um, no, that's actually, we could actually funny get into that story. But I met him <laughs> six years ago in New York. We had mutual friends. and But now mm-hmm. he's the best-selling author, entrepreneur. He created the School of Greatness. And the podcast came first, correct? Podcast came first. And then people just wanted more information. And I put together the they book. They did, right. Yeah. He's got a best-selling book. And it's kind of built around the philosophy that's encouraging people to go deeper with themselves, become the best version of themselves in all aspects of their lives. And so you interviewed truly great people who mm-hmm. had a lot to say. Yeah. And it was very successful. It still is very successful, your podcast. And your most recent book is a departure from that because you've had a lot of success. And we're going to hear, get into your old story, but it's called The Mask of Masculinity, How Men Can Embrace Vulnerability, Create Strong Relationships, and Live Their Fullest Lives. Now, before you like shut off, you're like, vulnerability, what? That's for chicks. No, no, we're getting into all of that mm-hmm. today. So congratulations on your book. I, I really, really enjoyed it. That's what Lewis is here to talk about today, about a lot of things. I'm excited to be here. Now, it I'd, sounds weird hearing your voice and being next to you it's like i'm in the podcast for the first time it feels i know you know you hear your voice as a listener you're like wow now i'm actually now you're here in it how is that it's very meta you know right it is i know and i was just yeah i I listened to yours i know i'm really glad because we talked about this a few years ago 
And it's funny, I was thinking about, God, there's, I mean, there's so many questions for you because I know you've been through a lot since I first met you. We were actually on a reality show together. Yes, we were. In 2011. I was kind of forced to be on it. Okay. You were getting paid to be on it as one of the stars. Barely, but Barely. right. And I was kind of manipulated. Yes. I was uh, a mutual friend of ours said, hey, come out to this thing and support my friend and, you know, just be there as my guest. Right. Like my, a friend of mine. And I was like, okay, but I don't want to be on this show. Right. <laughs> and then right away, like literally when I walk in the door, she's like, meet Amy and right. you should take her on a date and this and this. And I'm like, what? Right. Who, who is this? Why? Uh, first off, I'm, no, I'm not really interested in this person and no, not on TV. Right, exactly. And the producers are like wooing me and wowing me and like, will you please ask her for her number? Will you please ask her? Like, I remember that. This was at my book launch too, which they launch never party. film any of this. They, they, they cut out the book launch yeah. part, but they were all about, <laughs> right? yeah. You're like, I'm going to promote like, all oh, these books. <laughs> great, great. I didn't sell a goddamn book from that, but, but exactly. Lewis left up, but well, he went out with Amy. There was yes. three, and again, we're not trying to get you to watch the show, although you could if you're really interested. I think it's going to yeah. iTunes, but it's about three single dating experts do we practice what we preach? It's called misadvised. It was on Bravo and Lewis got fixed up on a date and I didn't know that it was a whole thing getting you to go out with her. But that's how we met and then we ran into each other here after yep. we both moved to LA and yep. you um, had your podcast. But I think it's funny because then we were, because now you're like removing your your masks of masculinity and then maybe your masks were still on. Oh yeah. I, think, I mean, right? I've always worn a lot of masks. I think as a as a driven, achieving, you know, athlete, I want to, uh, yeah, let's tell, let's hear your story because not everybody, yeah. let's pretend they don't know you. Some I mean, people I'm don't from, know you yet. Yeah, I'm from Ohio and I was just very driven to achieve in sports and I'll talk about why in a second, but my entire life I wrapped my identity around being a great athlete and uh, if I didn't win, I was a sore loser and so I just drove to always win in sports and to get bigger, faster, stronger. And it worked. You know, I was great in high school, college. I played professional football for a little bit. Uh, and then I got injured and for a couple of years was in Ohio on my sister's couch trying to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, who am I? My whole identity was wrapped around yeah. being an athlete. Now I can't be an athlete. Like, what do I even know about life or anything mm -hmm. other than sports? And so it was, uh, you know, trying to figure life out as like a young 20 year old something guy and uh, started getting into business. I had a lot of mentors who were kind of guiding me uh, and eventually kind of took off in this one business, sold it and realized that things still weren't working for me. Even though I had been successful in, in sports, made a lot of money in business, and sold this company eventually after a number of years, I was still like, why am I just insecure and unhappy and afraid and jealous and comparing right. constantly? And I turned 30, moved to LA. I guess I was 29 when I moved here, but I was around 30 when... I was going through a very toxic relationship that I didn't have the emotional capacity as a man to say what I needed to say and to remove myself from the environment. The intimacy was so powerful for me. The intimacy, the sex, the connection there was so profound that- it was too much. That was the problem? I was, was, well, I, was like, I was like, if I leave, I may never have this again. Okay. Like the, that's it was, what everyone thinks when they're about to leave a relationship. I was like, I, yeah, but the, so for 5% of the relationship was powerful in those moments. Right. The other 95%, it was like the most toxic, volatile experience of my right. life uh, that was so stressful. And I was always on eggshells, right? It's just like, didn't matter what I said, what I did, what I looked at, didn't look at, it was like, I was wrong, you know, as a man in the relationship. Yeah. And so all I was trying to do was please the relationship, like please her to make her right. feel happy. Because I think most guys want to make their they do. partner uh, happy. Yeah, they right? do. And when they're not happy at them, they say, okay, well, what can I do to make you happy? I didn't have the emotional vocabulary and, and language on how to express myself. So I started to express myself with anger. Mm -hmm. I started to get defensive when someone would attack me online or tweet at me something about whatever. I would respond back for days to defend myself. I would go play basketball and work out to kind of get this aggression out. This mm -hmm. like frustrating feeling I was having. And any time that anyone on the mean streets of West Hollywood would step to me <laughs> in a basketball game, I would like scream at them, shove them. Like I wanted someone to fight me. Right. I right. was like, bring it on. Let's do this. And then no stakes game of pickup basketball. Right. Cause you just, right. You just got to get it out. Cause you can't talk to your girlfriend about anything. No, you had, she didn't have the right, yeah. right. And so, um, all these things kind of came to a head when I got in a really bad fight, you know, four years ago, I, I 
beat the crap out of someone on a mm. basketball court. Like it finally happened where I instigated right. someone enough. He hit me and it gave me like the right in my mind to fight back. Okay. And um, it was just bad because. You, you were not a fighter before this. You're saying the aggression was coming out because you weren't able to deal with the, some of the emotions and the relationship. I mean, the last fight was like in high school or something. Right, right, okay. But yeah, no, I, you know, I played football. I was able to hit people and right. get away with it because it's legal. You know what I mean? So it was my ability to do that. Um, but when I didn't know how to express myself, it was like, well, what do I do? Right. How do I get this out there? And it's I not even like conscious, obviously. It's just not like, even conscious. Right. So this was a moment in my life where I was like, things are not working. I'm achieving financial results. You know, people looking at my podcast is taking off. These things are working. Pretty much every goal I set out to do, I made happen. Mm-hmm. Pretty much everything. Right. You know, I could get great looking girlfriends. I could, you know, make money. I was like figuring it out. But I was suffering constantly inside. How did you know you were unsettled if you had all these great things? What did it? F- you're walking around feeling yeah. angry. Yes. Feeling Resentful, less than, comparing yourself to others. Shameful, guilty, embarrassed. Okay. I mean, like maybe the fraud, like the whole imposter syndrome. Maybe like I have success, but I don't really feel like it. Or no, you don't go. Here's through what that. here's what I realize is people didn't actually know who I was. Mm-hmm. That I was constantly projecting a false sense of who I was mm-hmm. in the world. I acted like I had it always figured out, that I had the answers, that I was smarter than I actually was. Oh, I thought that I was, you did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> exactly. damn. Okay. Uh, I was projecting a false sense of masculinity to try to look good and to try to be okay in the world. I started to, for the first time ever, like ask for feedback. You know, I was 30 years old and I was like, okay, all these things aren't working. After this fight, I was like ran back to my condo in West Hollywood mm. and like was in my bathroom washing off the blood on my hands. Like Blood is all over the court. And the police department is like right across the street. And I'm like, I could have lost everything in this yeah. moment. This one stupid decision to like respond in this way, in a weak minded way, by allowing myself to hit mm-hmm. someone. It's so weak if you think about it. And what if someone had a knife? What if the cops were there and I went to jail? Like all the things that I've worked hard for my whole life could have been over or could have had like a mark on me in some way. And I remember just looking in the mirror at myself, just like shaking. I was like, what is wrong with you? Why are you this way? Why do you always respond with anger? Why are you always frustrated? Why are you always, you know, defensive Mm -hmm. in sports, but then in relationships in every area of your life. And you were still in this relationship at the time, kind of still, I was like trying to get out of it. You know what I mean? But like I was lingering because women end relationships typically because men are like trying or they, they go. I was a coward. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying to me because I was afraid to be alone as well. And I was afraid I would never have that intimacy again. And so I did for the first thing. I was just like, it was kind of like, it wasn't total rock bottom, but it was like emotional rock bottom. I was going to say, was it your emotional rock bottom? It sounds like. like, I remember I literally uh was sitting in my apartment for two weeks and I watched 88 episodes of Weeds. You know the show Weeds? (laughs) Yeah. 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 Like I literally didn't leave. For two weeks, I was just like laying. I mean, I got up and did whatever, got food every now and then, but I was pretty much in my bed watching weeds Why every weeds? single day. This was the one thing on? It was just the curious. thing on. I just watched a couple right, of them and I was it. like, like hooked, whatever. I was from okay. the beginning <laughs> and I was like, oh, there's 10 episodes wow. or 10 seasons. Let me just go through them all. And I just like wouldn't sleep. Mm-hmm. I would just watch show, TV all day uh-huh. long. It was in my escape for me. Right. And I started to ask for feedback. I was like, okay, enough is enough. Like I'm sick of feeling this. I've got to change my life. Otherwise, I'm probably always going to be You asked your way. friends for feedback, your family, people. I started asking yeah. friends. I started hiring therapists. I, I hired coaches. I was like asking my closest friends like. Like tell me why I'm the most fucked up. You know, I was just like, you know, what are the things that you like about me, that you enjoy about me? What do I do really well? Mm-hmm. What are the things that I don't do well? I was just like on all spectrums. Give me feedback. Mm-hmm. I was a demand for information about who I was and how I showed up in the world. Because before that, I never wanted feedback or criticism. We often talk about emotionally unavailable men, which is sort of the umbrella term, I think, for a lot of mm-hmm. different um, emotional challenges that men and women have. Emotionally unav- I've, been, I've been known to be emotionally yeah. unavailable. Um, I think your book deals with a lot of that. Dating any man that you ever thought, he doesn't quite get it, it'll be in this book. So what you're saying is you were asking him, so before that you were that guy, you're like, did I ask you for, for free? Did I ask you for that? Like if right, they asked, right. But now you're like, tell me. So with, there was a th- demand for it. Yeah, were there themes? The themes? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, pretty much that I'm was a coward on every area of my life. Coward? Was that the words they used? No, that's the word I used. I know, I know. I want to hear, so I wouldn't think Uh, they would use that. I think the feet name that was very defensive, that I was very guarded, that I was angry. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like the most loving, joyful, happy guy. (laughs) Like I always came from a place of like smiling and happy and joyful. 
But when moments of frustration came to me, it's like I only had one switch, mm -hmm. and that was to defend myself, to protect myself. Again, I was talking to therapists, coaches. I was like asking everyone. And I went to this workshop. It was a five-day workshop here in L.A., emotional intelligence training, that had a lot of games and exercises. It addressed the areas of our life that weren't working for us. So there's like 50 of us in this workshop, and this trainer was like going through different exercises and games to address the areas of our past that we still hold on to that keep us from living a more meaningful, fulfilling, rich life mm -hmm. in relationships, in our career, everything. And we're going through a lot of these things the first few days of you know our parents and the example they set and how we grew up like them and whatever, breakups we've gone through, divorces people have gone through, the things that we've been holding on to that still hurt us mm -hmm. and how we have these triggers and reactions. So for three days, people are opening up and expressing this and I'm kind of opening up and I'm acting like I've got it all figured out, but I'm talking about the different challenges I had growing up. And at day three, the trainer goes, okay, we've addressed everything from your past. Now we're going to move forward to create a vision for your life on how you want to live moving forward for the ultimate relationships, the ultimate career, mission, everything, your health. But we can't fixate on the past if you want to live a powerful future. So I was like, cool. And so he goes, if you haven't said anything you need to say yet, now is the moment. Otherwise, we're not going back. So you need to say it now or kind of forever hold your peace moment. got anxious. Okay, yeah. And so, <laughs> and so I'm sitting there. Again, there's 50 of us in a room and I'm sitting there. And I'm like, you know, I talked about my parents going through a divorce and like everyone in this room. And I talked about, you know, feeling like the youngest uh, of four and not having the attention that I wanted. I talked about being, uh, you know, picked on and bullied and picked last and being, uh, you know, in the special needs classes my whole life in school and just feeling insecure. For learning. Yeah, for learning mm -hmm. in school. And, uh, you know, I talked about my brother who went to prison for four years when I was eight years old and how I didn't have any friends during that time. What about that moment when I was raped by a man? And it kind of came in my head. And I was like, huh, yeah, that time when I was five when that man took me in the bathroom and raped me. Why have I never shared this with anyone? Why have I always held this a secret? Why has this always been the thing that I've never wanted anyone to know about me? And I just, for whatever reason, in that moment, I stood up, walked at the front of the room, and for the first time, told the entire story as if I was right there. And I couldn't look anyone in the eyes when I told this story. I was so ashamed of myself and so embarrassed by what people would think about. And I sat down and it was like I just erupted with tears. Mm -hmm. I just erupted. I couldn't control myself. I can imagine. Yeah. It was just like, a, it was so terrifying to let people see me. Yeah. And, and so this is something that you would completely repress in the sense of it, it, what, it didn't come up for you I that always much. knew it happened. Of course. I always yeah, think about it. It's in it. your body. Like yeah, I always think about it. But you're like, that was the one tab like, that would never come out. Right. It would never come out. And people right. would always ask me stuff about, you know, why are you so this and this? And Yeah, I'm you have a lot of deep about. conversations with people yeah. are asking and they're revealing. And but I would never, I never told them that. I just didn't no, want people to no, know. No, never right moment for that. Tell that. And um, it was the most challenging wow. thing because, because I was terrified. I ran out of the room afterwards because I couldn't stop crying. And mm -hmm. I was just like, I feel embarrassed. I'm scared. I don't know what these people are thinking about me. Luckily, there was two women on either side of me who were like holding me and crying with me that I felt like, okay, I'm somewhat safe in right, this moment. Right. But I was just so embarrassed that I ran out of this kind of hotel conference room, went across the street. There was like a wall. I put my head up against the wall like this and was just like, couldn't stop crying. And after a few minutes, it was like one of the most beautiful things that ever happened to me. These men who were in the room came up to me and started holding me, hugging me. And they were like, you're my hero. Mm. They were like, I've never seen a man do what you've done. Just did here. Like people are like, man, I've been judging you this whole time. I've thought of you with this other guy, you know, you're, you're a coward. Right. Well, that, well, you <laughs> know, I, I led with my ego a lot. No, I led right, with ego. Kidding. I led with coward. ego a lot. Right, and they were like, right. gosh, I've just been judging you. And, mm. and now I trust you. And some of the guys were like, you know, I've been sexually abused and I haven't told anyone. Well, right. It's so common. And I, I haven't told anyone and my wife doesn't know. And you're giving me permission to go tell my wife and have that conversation. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out a way to bring this back to sex because that's what this no, show is no, about. No, no, honey. No, no, no. But listen no, to this. This is, about, this is sexual but listen, abuse. But we listen to this. Not, we don't need to. You're listen perfect. to this. You're perfect. You know, if you want to have the, the greatest sex and relationship in general, if someone doesn't, if your partner doesn't know like the things that are most vulnerable to you, 
then you don't feel safe and you don't feel like you can trust that person. And therefore, you'll probably never fully emotionally expose yourself in bed and sex. Right. And something will always be holding you back. It may be powerful and great, but that intimacy where you look in someone's eyes and you both orgasm mm -hmm. emotionally, spiritually, right. physically, like that is unbelievable right. connection. No, it is. This is perfect. So what you're doing here, because I want to say what I'm hearing in that is that this moment of we all have secrets and things that we're ashamed of because we get into a relationship with someone and you know we always bring like what do they call it? like your first date like your your representative they say for a few dates like yeah. the best version of yourself or sometimes for a few years and there's certain things we just are like well I could never reveal this about me but this person won't love me they won't like me and a lot of times we haven't revealed it to anybody or maybe just our best friend and that's what true intimacy is right. and and you realize that it all the all the power that you've given this whatever the thing is that you're repressing all the all the energy you've given it once you like release it to the world right it no longer has power on you it freedom. releases you it's freedom it was instant i mean it was yeah. terror and i was scared and unsure of what was going to happen because i just didn't think i was allowed to right. say, say those things exactly but what happened afterwards was like it was unbelievable uh, right. freedom you know it took some like weeks and months for me to fully process and I was started telling my family, I started telling my friends one by one because this group really encouraged me to start talking about it more. Just like the relationships I had with my family, my family started saying things that I never knew about them, you know? Right, because you were able to tell them. So that's the thing. It's, it's not even about relationships with, it is about you know romantic relationships, intimate ones, but with your family and your friends, mm -hmm. there, when you start to, to really, you know, reveal this stuff, you realize that like it makes you, and that's how we talk about talk about it specifically the mask of masculinity because mm -hmm. men feel like it will make me more, uh, less manly I won't right. be a man yeah. if I'm vulnerable I'll be emasculated if I'm, I'll, I'm I'll be a, a girl I'll be a chick I'll be a less than a girl right I'll be gay I'll be whatever the names that kids called me growing up right exactly and it's like I don't want to be less than a girl no god no or Can't considered a girl exactly right and right. it's uh, yeah so that's just a lot of guys have followed this pattern not all guys where they don't feel like it's cool or okay to just share their feelings. And you were talking about before we jumped on, right. you guys as girls talk about this every day. Well, you get together in groups and you're like, ah, I'm going through this right now. Oh, I'm yeah. stressed out about every this. Every day I talk to my girlfriend. I mean, I, I'm lucky. I think a lot of women have this, so, but we are socialized from the time of, of we're babies. Like women mm. are just more social creatures the way we create. We make eye contact, all that stuff. And I feel like with my girlfriends, we, we do. I have the, the same, you know, 10 best friends that, you know, throughout the last 20, 15, 20 years. And I, they're all in San Francisco or all over the world, but right. I talk to them and we're not like, Hey, what shoes did you get? What makeup? We're like, okay, what happened with your husband? What's going on here? And yeah. we get into it. Like when I was 26 in San Francisco, I'd go to therapy every week. And after therapy, I went every Tuesday, my best friend, Mary and I would meet at Whole Foods and we would sit at the bulk food. We'd get the thing and we'd sit there, get coffee and we would just process our therapy for a year. I mean, yeah. it's like I've been, so women naturally do this. Men, not so much. You yeah. get together. So I think 50% of men feel like they don't have a guy friend they can right? share their, their stuff with. And so they get it from women, sort of, but then the women are constantly frustrated because like, he's not available, he's not available. So what I wanted to do today is because that's an amazing story about how you were able to open up and I'm sure your relationships have all improved. You were yeah. able to end that toxic one and yes. I think you're in a healthy relationship, yes. right? Yes. And it's not just it has to be trauma, although there are so many men. I'm glad you have se one in six men have sexual trauma. One in trauma. six men have been sexually abused sexually that abused. has been recorded. Right, you know? exactly. It's and, so hard uh, to get. Yeah, but there's and not one in like, three women. Is it one in three, one in four, one in mm -hmm. three women? Who's been, yeah, Telling, I'm yeah. sure more have been sexually harassed in some way or grabbed well, God, or we whatever. Can talk about that. Probably yeah, every all woman. day. Right. Um, but I, when I look at just this year alone, if you think about what's in the media this year alone, besides the hurricanes and the, and the flooding and the natural disasters, what are the moments that come to my mind are, first off, Charlottesville, which happened, and mm -hmm. angry men marching who are, feel unsafe and unprotected and don't know how to express themselves emotionally and verbally, so they march and, and attack and with anger. Right. I'm not, not getting into politics here, but the dis-ease from the political decision-making and reactions to anything that happens in the world, the reactiveness, the defensiveness, the guard, you know, the guardedness, the needing to be right, needing to win feeling that is happening in our politics. Again, a man, the, uh, Harvey Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yes. Right. Last week, two weeks ago. And now the Amazon executive right. or whatever, the sexual harassment, the sexual abuse that happens, the domestic violence that happens from people in the NFL or pro sports, yeah. Vegas, the Vegas shooting, yeah. 
a man who's just like, I can't express myself verbally, so I'm going to just unleash exactly. and spread my anger on the world and then end it. All these instances that are just in the last six months come from angry men or men who feel unsafe that feel like they don't know how to express themselves. They've never been trained or they don't have the emotional capacity to. And listen, I'm right there with these men in a sense of like, I've been angry and reacted in ways that are very defensive and guarded. Now, thankfully, I've never sexually molested or done these things or no, killed anyone. No, you beat a guy up by the basketball exactly. court. So it's exactly. all like next time. Next year could have been. You know, Who knows? But you get it. Exactly. No, that's what we're saying. I, okay. Yeah. Well, wait, we're going to take a quick break. When yes. we come back, God, there's so much more to delve into. I think that a lot of guys and women, you know what I love is that your book is also for women. Absolutely. Listen, this, you're going to recognize yourself and, and women, if you're dating a man, you're like, oh yeah, that's what it is. And we're going to tell you how to deal with it. Lewis House's book is The Mask of Masculinity. Also, thanks for supporting our sponsors. I love them. I never talk about products or surfaces or anything that I haven't used and that I'm not actually obsessed with. So thank you um, for keeping the show free and supporting them. And we'll be right back. Okay, Lewis, we're back. I've got so many more things to talk to you about. This is exciting. Okay, Mask of Masculinity is his book. So this is what we're talking about is like this classic journey towards self-awareness, right? Like we, a lot of us are driven by goals, certain ambitions. Once we get the job, the car, the house, the wife, then everything will be perfect. We're going to be happy. We're going to be successful. And then you get there and then you're like, huh. I still feel empty. Something's wrong. I mean, you, it's a classic, yeah. right? It's a classic tale yeah. of, um, of self-awareness. I forget the celebrity that said this. I don't know if it was Jim Carrey or someone that was like, I wish everyone in the world could become rich and famous and realize that that's not like the key to No. Well, there was a great there. quote in your book that I pulled out, actually. What did it say? Whatever success you're after, someone has already achieved it, deluded himself into thinking that just a little more of it would make him happy and solve all his problems. <laughs> exactly. Guess what? It didn't. Yep. So everything that we're chasing and we think we look at that person, if you're looking outside yourself to mm. achieve it, they're so happy. They're, if I just make a little more money, if I only meet this person and everything's going to be great. And the bottom line, everyone can tell you, mystics, psychic, the Buddha, anyway, wherever you go, it's the, it comes from mm. the inside. It comes mm. from all this stuff. But I also think that we are talking, you know, I think there's a lot of women who are a little more self-aware about this. I'm not saying every woman on the planet, but for men who are listening going, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I haven't been abused. I mean, I, my life is mm -hmm. actually really good right now. Like, I don't even really know what you're talking about. And I could tell you that if they just called me for five seconds, I could probably, we do take callers sometimes too. Yeah. I think I could get to that in, a, I could get that in five seconds. Like, have you ever dated a woman who was like, you're not really emotionally available or I feel like when I'm with you. I'm kind of alone or I feel like you don't really share things like, babe, we talk all the time. Mm -hmm. So those people, those guys maybe who are like, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. These masks represent yeah, let's a, talk about a, masks. a, a part of our, what we think is our identity. They represent our, what we think is our self-worth, you know? And for me, I was picked last in fourth grade on a dodgeball game, but there was two captains, two guys that uh, to come back to the story from the beginning, there was my uh, fourth grade teacher said, okay, we're not going out to recess by ourselves. We're going to do like a class dodgeball game. And he picked two of the popular kids to be the captains and they chose one by one, right? And there was like 30 kids in the class, let's say 15 boys, 15 girls. I can't remember exactly. And I'm thinking I'm one of the taller kids. You know, I'm probably going to be picked one of the first. Yeah. And they go through one by one and pick all these guys until it comes down to the last two guys, me and the nerdy looking guy who had, you know, the glasses in the pocket yeah. square and that kid. Right. And I'm like, there's no way they're not going to pick me after, before, uh, after this guy. And they end up picking this other kid before me. And so I'm the last boy to be picked. But then something happens. The next picker picks a girl and then picks another girl. And then picks another girl until it's down to me and the last girl in the class. This girl can barely even walk. She's like so uncoordinated. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be the last one picked. And they picked the girl. And by default, I go on the last team. I don't even get picked. Okay. So I'm less than a girl in my mind, in like my fourth grade mind. And, that and I said, never sense. again will I get picked last. So we've, whether I was sexually abused or not before this, I said, never again will I be picked last. And I'm going to become so big, so fast, so strong, so... Uh, valuable that people always have to pick me first wow. in sports huh. and it worked it I trained you. myself every single day I starting used that then fuel. like in third, was third grade fourth grade, fourth grade. I, this like negative fuel to prove people right. wrong like drove me every day and I had that chip on my shoulder right. and it worked I was you know a great athlete in high school college you know everything else like that played professional sports 
and I proved those kids wrong. And who even, yeah, and who even knows if you would have played sports? Who knows? It's that, well, those pivotal moments, right? Where you're like this, or those. So here, here's the thing. Okay. I proved all those kids wrong, and anyone else <laughs> wrong who thought I wasn't good enough or whatever or had like something for me, I proved them all wrong. But man, every time I lost at anything, I was the worst loser. Right. The because it was like an attack on my identity right. and my self worth. If I'm not going to win, then people aren't going to accept me. Mm-hmm. And the worst loser, the worst winner, you know, I rubbed it in their faces and it never felt good. I achieved mm-hmm. these big dreams that I wanted. And when I would achieve them, I was like, why am I still not fulfilled? Right. It's because I was driven by this false sense of identity. Right. And then again, when I lost, when I wasn't able to play football anymore and I got injured, my self-worth was wrapped around this idea of being an athlete. Right. This is what happens with men who, wear, who have the material mask. You know, when I was broke on my sister's couch for a couple of years, I was like, I don't want to feel this way anymore. Mm-hmm. I need to learn how to make money. And I started researching. I found mentors who are millionaires. I was like, I'm going to obsess over this. I'm going to focus on getting nice things, everything. And it worked. I made millions of dollars. I built mm-hmm. a business. I was like, you know, had access to things. And the money was never enough. Like I was living in scarcity. Like when, in, and then when the money started to go down on my bank account, I freaked out. Right, exactly. Because you're free. Was, yeah, my self worth was wrapped around my net worth. And so some guys, you see that they always need something else to. Right. to so you went you know, from like athleticism, from being number one with that, to money. To and I think make, it's yeah. interesting your stories because even well, this was up until four years ago because your school of greatness, you're mm-hmm. on your book. I there was a chapter in your book you were saying like you're on this book tour, yes. and you have everything, and people are signing up, and your book sold New York out, Times bestseller, New York Times and your agents like everything Dude, I wanted, everything you wanted, and then you're in your hotel room lonely, going. And I, I guess I have to say like I, and even as a woman, I'm not, and here's the other thing, women have these masks as Absolutely. well. I can't tell you how many times. I mean, I've gone through this. I thought like even when I met you doing misadvised, and for me it was more about it was never like I wanted to um. It was never about fame. It was never about money except I was super broke during misadvice. I was like living on a friend's couch. I had no money. I sold All you everything girls were, I, I think, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Julia was broke. Everyone was Yeah, yeah, we're all. And I was like, but I just I just love how I, I know doing this podcast is my passion. I love, I mean, and it still is helping people and, it, and people listen to it. So why aren't they making, I just kept doing it. My parents mm-hmm. like, you're crazy. I'm like, but it's so close. For me, it was about how can I make this thing happened so it could be sustainable. And it wasn't, and it wasn't so much about like, you know, now I finally can like, I, ha- I have the money. I have a lot of things I wanted, but sometimes, you know, yeah, there's still that. Now I have all that. I put all my energy to that. And then, you know, where's yeah. my community? I left them in San Francisco, you know, so there's always going to be little things, but the more where you are now, I know like what's missing and where you go. So we kind of flip around these mm-hmm. things in our life, but the, I guess just the more self aware you are that's it. about where things are at. So now, so you did the book tour. So you did went from athleticism, then uh-huh. the athlete, Making then money. the book tour. And then you're like, yep. whoa. And then you had this breakdown. Well, then I was in the, you know, wearing the sexual mask. Sexual mask, like, right. Well, I can't be with one woman because I'm getting all these women, you know, my whole, my whole childhood, high school, no girls liked me, right. you know, because oh, I was you're one like, of those. Was that the, never ends. The guys I was were like, the dumb kid who was in the special needs classes. You know, my brother was in prison when I was eight years old till I was twelve for selling drugs to an undercover cop. So I didn't have the parent. Right. The, the parents in my neighborhood wouldn't let their friend, their kids, hang out with me. So I didn't have friends, wow. and I was like dumb in class, and I was like six four when I was eight, and I just looked goofy and all these things. And so now I have some financial success. Right. I have some athletic success. I have this. The book success and like women were desiring me and I was like, oh, now I need to get mine. Right. And I need to like right. show my self worth. I gotta get back around. some chicks. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta prove to myself that like I can get this. Right. And that's and that's like, still empty. Lonely. This is like so classic. Right. Guys like, go through these I? cycles. I know so yeah, you go through yeah. the cycles, you got all the money, then you can get the women, then you get the job and the cars. And ultimately it's all freaking empty mm. until you love yourself, know yourself and become vulnerable mm-hmm. and real. Like I, you know, I guess a long time ago, I realized I, I don't, I don't remember when, like years, but it's like, I can't even have, it's hard for me to have those people in my life that are superficial, that they don't really know me. They don't connect. I just, I am wherever I go, you yeah. know, there I am. Not that I'm always, I'm always learning and stuff, but I think for men, it might be a little bit different in the sense of, although there are men who've done a lot of work, but you're like, if I'm vulnerable and I show you this weakness, I am a weak man, like yes. a mass kick. And a lot of that is like, I'm less than the whole thing. So what I want guys to understand who are listening to and women, again, if they haven't gone through this, like what is the catalyst? Like I want, what I like about the book is it's set up in a way if you will find yourself in one of these masks. Absolutely. And I think we should go through them. Multiple masks for some. You know, but if they haven't hit their emotional rock bottom, you know, why should they, why should they read it? Because I, I, 
you know, I want them to get there. It's really hard. But to get, because I always feel like, for me too, it was being completely broke, trying to live my dream of the sex with Emily thing, which everyone thought was crazy. You you know, what are you doing? And I thought, no, I, ha- I have to do it because it's like so important. It's going to change the world. And it was crazy, but I'm glad I stuck with it. That was my thing. It was like I kept mm-hmm. pushing it and it made it happen in a lot of ways. But then I realized that there were other things that were empty, like, oh, I can help everyone out those rela- with the relationships and I don't have one of my own. So yes. the point is, I've been it's there. Yeah. Yes. This is the challenge. You know, everything was working in my life on the outside. Like I was getting results. When people gave me feedback, I was like, screw you. You're not doing this in your business. You're not doing this. You're not, you know, or whatever. I was like defensive. It's really hard because people start to look at themselves differently when there's, they go through a divorce or a bad breakup or a health scare or a, a near-death experience or someone close to them dies. That's when people That's start when to at, right. look and be like, let me you know, look at my life and see how do I want to live. So it's hard to get men to be aware and look within when they don't feel like they need to. Right. That's why I think this book is going to be powerful for women. Because women have a massive influence over men in intimate relationships, whether they think so or not. And when you can understand the man in your life who might be disconnected or might be focused on this or on that or is defensive or always needs to be right and win in your arguments or puts down people, whatever it may be, or is always telling a joke. It's just constantly Yeah, let's talk about some of the mess. Because that's what I was going to say. A lot of times there's the rock bottom that like someone dies or you're, you know, you lose a job or you lose a loved one and that's when people seek help. And I always was thinking about this, like maybe that's just what needs to happen. I think that's what I was trying Mm -hmm. to say about like, I told myself I would never be able to do business, right? I was like, I'm just doing a podcast to help people. I don't understand business. But then it became this need that I had to do it. And there's some people like, like my dad died. I had to go in when, suddenly when I was 20, I had to go to therapy. Like things happened that were really hard, but for people, so I'm wondering like what pushes someone towards self-awareness if they don't have that and maybe whatever, that was my yeah, point, but let's just talk about some of these masks because they might realize that yeah. they're in it. So I've got them here, but you probably know Sure, that. sure. Yeah, yeah. The material mask is huge. Like for me, a guy's driving well, around his fancy Especially in LA. Guy. It's like you said, uh, every, night, like every guy Like the nicer the car, off. like don't want to go out with you. And that's and judgy, listen, but listen, true. I, you know, I have friends who have private jets and who have amazing cars and like own islands, literally. Right. And, but they're so humble yeah. and they're giving and they're, they don't make it about showing it off. They make it more about like, Sharing an experience with Sharing you. it and let me live a lifestyle that it inspires you not to like, you know, show you how good I am. And so there's a way that you can approach this. Right. You don't need to make it, you know, not, you can still have nice material things and live luxurious if that's what you want. Right. But if it's just to prove to yourself that you're worthy of something. It's very Do you think fleeting. it's just an age thing though? It's like a younger man, Probably. younger person's game. Like in your twenties, you kind of like you think that's what matters, maybe, and then it's so hard because because I, I can't mean, tell guys if they want to get the first watch or the first here's, car. Here's the thing: the, it for starts, women, the designer bag, you know, I don't exactly. Know. I mean, it starts with like the classroom, the experience. It starts with the athletic experience. You know, when you're on a sports team or you're in a classroom and you're just walking through the halls as a guy, you're going to see other guys saying things about you or saying things about other people or if you're like emotional or crying they're gonna say stop crying stop being a little girl or don't be a pussy don't be a fag don't be whatever the word is that they're saying and it's like if your mom is like you know what honey today i want you to practice like being very giving and open and loving at school like go go in and like really be kind to the other kids and you say, okay, mom, I'm going to go do that. And you're kind and you're loving and you see a couple bullies bullying another kid. And you're like, hey, guys, don't pick on him. And then they take you and shove you in the locker mm-hmm. or do whatever, or right. be- beat you up. You're like, okay, Bad this advice. doesn't feel good. Right. And I need to protect myself. I need to arm myself. And that's what men are living with all the time. I totally get that. So these ma- so these are the masks, it's like mm-hmm. this, the, the athlete mask, the material mask, the sexual mask aggression, men are using mm-hmm. aggression, the joker, the funny guy. You're yep. like, I love hanging out with him. He's a great texter, but it takes you a few dates. You're like, but he's so fun. But he uh-huh. said nothing. I know <laughs> nothing about this guy. I mean, yeah. I know all these guys. Exactly. The invincible guy, you know? Yeah, the guy who he's takes got the biggest this. risks. Yep. You know, the know-it-all. That's so annoying. Mansplaining. <laughs> you gotta mansplain to them. God, the alpha mask. Yeah. That they're just the alpha man. I just can't take any of these guys. I see that. I, mean, I guess Here's it's just thing. experience. I've yeah. been all these. Right. I was gonna say, every life. man is, right? Every man, at least, it, like, we would lead with like a dominant one or two, right? right. Every man does does and or has and i'm still aggressive from time to time i'm still competitive and we need to win in arguments sometimes 
luckily I have been working on this for four years for myself. And now it's funny because I was in the airport last week trying to get somewhere and I missed my flight and I literally wanted to punch a wall because I was so furious that of what had happened. And I was going to make it uh, about the TSA people and them like making me take forever and double all this stuff. And I just felt like they weren't helping me. Like the customer support there wasn't helping me. And my old way of being would have been like screaming, making a scene, throwing a fit, punching something, kicking something, a trash can, storming out of there and feeling angry the rest of the day. And so I was like, I was so furious. I wanted to just automatically go to that place. And I just started like smiling inside because I was like, isn't it fitting that I'm writing this book about masculinity? And here's a great test for me. How do I want to show up? yourself in that moment. How do I want to show up? Do I want to show up and act like a jerk to this person and to make a scene and make it about me? Or where's the lesson? And can I recommit to my vision of what I want to do right now mm-hmm. and who I want to be and walk out of here gracefully and... You know, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, and I did. And you catch it in that moment. And it might happen. It's awareness. Right. It's aware this is all talk about self awareness. It's awareness and it's practice. You know, every morning I practice meditation. You don't have to, but you can just practice for five minutes saying, How do I want to show up today when shit hits the fan? I'm not allowed not sure if I'm allowed to swear this. When stuff happens, how do I want to respond? So in the morning, I will talk about the things I'm really grateful for and how I want to show up. And I'll say, you know, what if someone cuts me off today? What if someone says something to me? What if someone tweets something negative? What if someone, I feel attacked by someone? How do I want to show up? And I train myself before adversity happens because it's going to happen almost right. every day. Right. And people, for other people, know. it could be other things. How am I going to deal with Whatever. What if my wife says this to me? How am I going to respond today? Right. As opposed to constantly getting defensive when I smile and give her a hug. Right. How about that? Or exactly. Listen. And, You're listening. And, and yeah, I think, you know, the, the definition of the alpha mask, uh-huh. if I, you know, it's not the man who is like, can always puff his chest and always be the loudest. You know, the ultimate alpha silverback gorilla, the most impressive one to me is the one that is so like big in his energy. Doesn't even right, have to be that big. About how we, right. He's just so graceful and confident with his energy mm-hmm. that when a couple of other monkeys are screaming and fighting, he doesn't have to like beat his chest and run up there and like show how big he is. He can literally just with his energy move people away and diffuse the situation mm-hmm. and bring peace and harmony back to the moment. You're gonna create that a lot of these the men. Alpha, right? Ultimate alpha. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Men who are like right, they're self aware, they're authentic, they're not being competitive, they understand intimacy. And and I, connection I, yeah, and, and I think it's like, serious. listen, we can be competitive. We can be like manly, masculine, like aggressive in moments that are okay with that. But when right. it's hurting other human beings, you Got know, it. and it's just to prove yourself that you're worthy or something, you're really, it's not helping you long term. Wow. No. Yeah. No, you, you, you're Still gonna, be a man. Wear a beard. Do all these things well, that you want to do. Thing. We have to get into questions in a minute, yes. but that's what I Let's want. Let's just, yeah, because you're going to help the people here because we love helping our, our listeners. But, I feel like the bottom line here, really, if there is, is, is that I recognize so many men in here. You've been all of them. I think men float between all of these. And that I, I can't tell you, I keep thinking of it as the emotionally unavailable umbrella, male umbrella. When people say to me all the time, like, why are there no good men? Why are there no good men? And perhaps men are saying the same things about women. That's fine. But what I see, seem to see, and I've dated a lot of them, is they haven't done their work. So years ago, I decided if a man hasn't done his work, and I talk about this on the show all the time, that I believe that everybody needs therapy in some sense, whatever that looks like to you. You know, it's been 12 gazillion shows. What I like about your book, The Mask of Masculinity, is that if you guys read this, then you're going to kind of understand what I mean by saying that, like why doing the work is going to help you not just in your relationship, but in your job, in your relationship with your family. And if you've always thought, well, I didn't really get what you mean. What kind of work I need to do? Like why or what's going to drive me there? I think this is going to help you. And I love that you have advice for women here who deal with men. It can be a sister dealing with a brother. Like it doesn't have to be a romantic yeah, relationship, but father, the kind of support son, everything. Whatever. Exactly. I think there's a great place for men to start. Whether you re- read the book or not it is irrelevant to me. It's just a matter about how are you going to work on yourself yeah, so that up. you can heal. Exactly. How are you going to do that? Whether it's listening to this and well, kidding. you know, I want to, but <laughs> but you know, like, like have a conversation. That, that very- have a conversation with like after you're done listening to this. Here's something you can do to show you um, that you're working on yourself. Take out your phone and text someone in your life that inspires you, that makes an impact in your life, or that you appreciate, and text them one to three sentences of why 
they mean something to mm-hmm. you. Something specific about who they Be are. Specific, I like that. Wh- what they do. Your compliments, your words, and send them a nice message. It's like a way of expressing vulnerability through a text that maybe you don't acknowledge people enough. It's something small mm-hmm. to get started, and then continue to have a conversation. Find someone. I always say start by writing the things down that hurt you the most so that maybe you don't want to express it to someone. I think eventually we're going to have to talk it out and express through our words, but write down those things in your life that really upset you. And then ask yourself, why do these upset me? And here's the thing. If you want to be a powerful man, if you want to make the most money in the world, have the best job, get the hottest girl, whatever these things are, if you want these things... Then you and will, be, if you want them and you want to be happy and fulfilled. Exactly. You will, you will write these down and you'll ask yourself a simple question. Why do these things have power over me? The ultimate man or human being does not allow for past things to own him, right. to control and consume his energy and his thoughts. He has power and control over being sexually abused, his parents fighting with him, whatever happened, the girlfriend dumping him. He doesn't allow the past to consume control his mind his and control present. him. Yep. I think Dr. Martin Luther King said something along these lines. I can't remember specifically what he said, but that he doesn't get angry when people were you know, attacking him or saying racial things about him because he's like, I'm never going to allow that man to have power over yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. It is a choice at every moment. That's it. And if you want to be the ultimate man... You won't be defensive and guarded all the time. You'll learn how to grow into being loving, graceful, and live in harmony. It's true. Like you're doing right now. Great example. I'm trying every day. We're I know. Well, failing hey, we're constantly never and trying. But we're never done with it. Yes. But I think it's, a, it's a, a book that men can easily, I don't know, they digest, get into it. And like I said, it's just um, everyone needs to do their work. Yes. So, yes. And I think this is uh, the way to do it. Thank you. I like it. Okay, I've got five questions for you. Bring it. These are the quickie questions, and then we're going to get into other people's questions. Ready, Lewis? You got You can't think I'm about in. these too much. Quick answers, or how yeah, long? Quick I answers. Okay. Don't like, think about it like too five, much. Five, ten First seconds. Thing. Yeah, like, okay. like not even. Okay. But no pressure. No pressure. Because I don't, you know. I'm in. Your biggest turn on. <laughs> um, is this the PC? Doesn't matter. Uh, or it's a sex tur- podcast. Let's be honest. Biggest turn on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know what it I want to. It could be say. eyes. It could be. Um, it could be. Uh, I think, uh, Voice I mean, you. I had a lot of different things, but the first thing that comes yeah, to mind first. after the, uh, the other things I was thinking about, <laughs> the first on, thing that comes no to mind editing. is when a, when a girl, when a, when a woman, uh, sees my dreams and fully supports it as opposed to like holds me back from my dreams. Oh, okay. It makes me so, so turned you. on. Got it. It turned you out. Yeah. When, the, when I'm seen. supportive. Being seen yes. and supported. Okay. Biggest turn off. When they, uh, get jealous or insecure when I'm going after my dreams. Oh. Okay. Because I'm like, you don't don't get me. Yeah. Uh, Craziest place you've gotten busy? Unique place? I don't know. Back of cars, bathroom in a club one time. Got it. Not that crazy. It's okay. Sexiest part of uh, your partner's body or anyone's body that you, you know, a woman's body. My partner's pretty sexy. I don't know. Just when she bends over, I don't know if she turns me on. Awesome. What's the one thing that you wish you could tell your current or all future partners about your body's needs? Like, what's the one thing when you're with a woman, you have a girlfriend now, but like, what does Mm -hmm. she need to know about your body? When she connects to my eyes, everything opens up. Mm, So true. Window to the soul and a lot of other things. I mean, listen, I like when anyone goes down on me, but you know. Who doesn't like a little blowjob now and then? A little blowjob. Okay, got it. That was very good. We're going to get into some emails. Thank you, Lewis House. Yes. You having fun? I am. Good. I love it. We're going to go into the sex toy closet. Let's do it. It's really fun. Okay, (laughs) let's answer some questions first. Okay. Hey, guys, here's the deal. Guess what? I love getting your questions. We get hundreds of them. We try to get back to all of you. We really do. But guess what? When you text us, it's not only easier for you, but we're going to answer your questions first because <laughs> we want more text. Here's the thing. It is so easy because you're on your, I know you're probably on your phone right now listening to the podcast. So you go to your phone and this is what you do. Ready? You type in 797979, like you're texting a phone number, right? Like a real, it is a phone number, 797979. And then you type, ask Emily one word. That's it. No, no hashtags, no nothing. Just ask Emily. You do that. You press send. Guess what? A second later, boom, you get a link. You click on that link. And it's a form. And that form says, hi, ask me your question. It's so easy, you guys. We're not going to like sell it or spam you or text you weird things like free iPods or something. Remember we used to do that, the free iPod? Do they make those anymore? (laughs) We would never do that. That's a fun way. You could also go to our website, sexwithemily.com and send us an email there via the Ask Emily tab. 
As always, include your gender, your age, where you live, and how you listen to the show. Hi, Emily. I really enjoyed the show. I've been listening a lot lately. I've been with my wife for almost six years, and we've literally experienced every issue imaginable, minus cheating. But I won't go into details because it would fill a book. She came to the relationship as a survivor of both physical and sexual abuse, and during all of this, our sex life was pretty normal. We found some semblance of balance and saw our issues falling away after moving cities and starting over. About a year and a half ago, we basically stopped having sex. She said she needed something but couldn't articulate what she wanted. I was confused and hurt and thought it might be because something I did. I wanted to take action, so I started reading books and articles about game theory. I read a lot about dudes preaching to other dudes and how to get more women. Terms like alpha and beta were thrown around. I was told to appear more like this guy and not like that guy, and she'd be falling at your feet begging for sex. I bought into this heavily, but here's the catch. None of it worked. I think it may have caused more trauma by trying this. This brings me to my question. Can you talk about toxic masculinity? The way we treat our partners could be potentially damaging and have consequences that I don't wish on my greatest enemy. How can we avoid this and be more aware? Thanks for your amazing work. I will eagerly await new episodes while I devour past ones. We've been actually been repairing our relationship as we listen to your podcast. Thank you. Ryan, 27 Seattle. Wow. Thank you, Ryan, so much for your email. Well, I thought that this would be a great one that Lewis Howes, you could uh, help me with here because, mm. well, first of all, it sounds like he read the game or something. I yeah. love that you've Neil been Strauss was great. He's a good friend of mine, and I, I love that he was in your book. Um, but yeah, he read the game, like that wasn't working, and he wants to talk about being like the toxic man. This is challenging because, you know, <laughs> again, we go back to high school or college or whatever, when you see like the hot girl with like the bad guy the guy that treats her wrong or you have a girlfriend and maybe has a boyfriend that's like treats her like crap. And right. you're like, why are you so turned on by right. that? Why are you so attracted to that? Or why do you stick around? So I don't know. You need to explain to me why yeah. women stick around with that because yeah. I've never understood well, that. Well, I'm not saying so women need to do their work as well. So typically Absolutely. it's because of a woman have something from their past. It's a familiar pattern. So maybe, you know, her dad was a philanderer mm. or maybe, you know, her first relationship was with a guy like that. And she also probably has low self-worth. There's mm. things, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons for it, but typically most things, most of our patterns in life and in relationships can be traced back to very early childhood memories of what happened. And we just tend to recreate those patterns yeah. or it could even have been our first heartbreak, or our first love. And they were kind of a jerk. We kind of go after that. But typically a lot of the reasons why we pick bad partners is when we're feeling like we're half a person and we need someone else to fill the other half Ooh. to make us whole. Mm -hmm. And the best place to time to find somebody is when you actually are feeling more whole. Whole. Yes. Yeah. It's smart. So that's what I got to yeah. say about that. Yeah. But, no, um, that's tough. I think you got to, I mean, listen, everyone's different. So I think asking her what turns her on, asking her what makes her feel alive, asking her what he could do, say how he looks at her and what makes her feel the most sexually desired. Right. And then lean more into that. And that might be a challenging conversation yeah. to have. But I think, no, I think so too. Cause I feel like you're reading these books and you're doing these things. What about talking her. to her more? <laughs> it sounds like you guys have been together. Yeah. I kind of need to, it was our long email. You've been together for six years. It's your wife. Yeah. To me, stop reading these books on your own. Do this work yeah. together. You're <clears> living with her and just be like, let's figure this out together. Maybe you guys read books together. You take classes together. You said she sought regular therapy. Maybe it's time for your own conversation couples therapy and I'm a mm -hmm. huge fan of sexual therapy. Oh my God, Ooh. I know some great therapists in Seattle. You're in, I know some great sex therapists in Seattle. And, so, and so. I'll give him some advice too. I mean, I had a girlfriend that in the past that wasn't as like sexually open, I would say. Not that I was like wanting to do kinky stuff, but just more like emotionally sexually yeah. open. You know what I mean? Just always felt like a little closed off and I felt like it was affecting the way I felt. So I started asking her, you know, you know, I want to, I have a request. There's some things that I would like to ask you about and what I like. And I'd love to learn what you like as right. well. That would turn you on, that make you feel open because I feel like I'm not getting everything that I want and desire as well. Right. And um, it worked. It was scary because you don't want to offend someone or right. hurt someone or make someone feel bad or whatever. So it took me months of not asking because I was like, well, we'll figure it out or right. I'll learn No, it some never trick. figures out. That's a, th yeah. It's just like asking. And, and I was like very specific. I was like, when you do this specific thing, it drives me crazy in a good way. When you right. do this, when you look at me this way, just to like embed these suggestions. Exactly. You and then she started doing it and I was like, damn, I feel freaking good. You exactly, know? right? And I think that it is. It's talking to your partner like, what are the things that... What really turned you on? What are you looking for? What you know? You, I always love the bucket list thing. Like you each write down the three things Ooh. that you both want to try, and you exchange a list. That's a good idea. Yeah, I love that one. I mean, so there's a lot of different ways you guys could do it together. Because when you said she stopped having sex with you, there could be a lot of reasons for that. But I think that you might be trying to figure it out on your own, mm -hmm. and really like she's gonna have to be part of this equation because you're not gonna be able to read her mind. 
Hi, Emily. Thanks so much for your podcast. I've been listening for two years. I'm seeking some advice about comparing yourself to a partner's ex. In my case, a girlfriend's ex. I find myself dwelling over men before me and it's giving me anxiety. Perhaps they had bigger muscles and bigger Mm. everything. Was their sex more adventurous? Was it more pleasurable? I give my girlfriend what she requires emotionally and we have great sex. I just can't help but compare myself to other men. Any advice or discussions would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Dylan, 26, Chicago area. Yeah, I mean, we all get insecure, right, in relationships. I think that men also have a really hard time thinking there was ever a penis that came before them. It's the worst feeling. Right? Like, you're like, there were other penises. And then they ask about it. They're like, how many? And they're like, oh, my God, there were that many. So much has shifted for me in the last couple of years. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's like you're in L.A. and everyone's talking about open relationships. Maybe it's like a different (laughs) conversation out here. I used to be so jealous and insecure of the guys that girls dated in the past. Like, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to, like, know what positions you're in or what happened where. And it would, like, drive me nuts when that, like, was in my mind. Mm -hmm. If I knew something had happened, it was like, God, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I hated that feeling. Right. Comparing and always trying to, like, one-up the last guy or something. Exactly. And for some reason, something changed in the last few years. And I think that happens when we don't want to be alone and we don't want to feel like she could leave for someone else or someone better. And I used to always feel that way. Like, I didn't want to be alone. I didn't want them to leave me unless I left them or whatever. Right, you know what I mean? Of like, course. And now I've just come to a place where I'm like, you know what? I can be with my girlfriend now and I cannot be with her. Right. And it's if it doesn't work out or if she wants someone else, I want her to be happy. I ultimately want her to be happy. And if it's not with me or if she had fun in the past, I, I want to embrace that. Right. And it's like hard to do. I mean, it took me 32 years of my mm-hmm. life to get to that point because I was the complete opposite. I felt constantly conflicted when another guy ever touched her and that guy was around still or whatever. They were friends. It was like, no, yeah, you can't yeah. be friends with the them. Ex, right. Um, but I think it's just like a inner peace. Yeah. Again, working on working like. On this. What, what is his mask? Do we know? I'm not laughing. I'm not um, on the spot here, but yeah, he's kind of talking about his insecurities right here. So that is being vulnerable, but yeah, I think um, it depends on how, how. I don't know. It could be it could be stoic if he's not expressing it to her. It could be stoic. It could be even alpha as well. I mean, the alpha is the one right, who's insecure. He's, one, he's got muscles. Things. Like, the alpha is the one who's like, I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to like prove that mm-hmm. I'm like the bigger man. Exactly. I mean, I think is that we all do get insecure. Insecure, and I'm wondering like. Is there something in you that's making you insecure? Did someone say something to you once that you feel like you have a small... Because he said his penis. He's like, well, maybe his penis was bigger. Right, right. There's something that you're thinking that you're not good enough. And I'm going to take a gander here, uh, Dylan. I'm. It's, this is probably coming out in other areas of your life as well. Probably in your work, mm. relationships, where you're just not feeling like you're you're fully yourself. And so... Um, but your your girlfriend's with you. You guys you are have having great, great sex. sex. Yeah, I don't you're know emotionally the connected. Is. There's actually no problem. The good news <laughs> here is that the problem problems in your mind yeah. and your thoughts and those thoughts aren't you that's not necessarily yeah, exactly. you so you can easily change this you know the past should be her past and i think when you find yourself you do a little trick when you find yourself thinking those thoughts take yourself into the moment and think about like this connection that you guys that you're having with her and then just be grateful for something that you have the connection you have with her and that's that's hard work and you also just got to be confident in yourself if you are constantly insecure that means you get to work on your inner confidence your right. inner peace like what are you afraid of What's the worst thing that can happen? And, and what have you not embraced? There. Yeah. If like you're afraid of something, you've got to really embrace those fears right. and then you can walk around in your relationship and be like, you know, if this doesn't work out, like I'm okay. Right. It's going to hurt and it's going to suck, but I'll be okay. Exactly. Cultivating confidence is the most important work. I think top three things mm-hmm. we all need to work on. Mm-hmm. So thank you, Lewis. Thank Fabulous you. Fabulous having here. This is so this fun. Was, it's been a long time in the making. This was very powerful for me. So oh, thank you for God. letting me share. Powerful for me too. It was really great. I um, I'm really happy for you. I'd love to see you growing into this man that you are thank and you. setting a great example for men and women out there. Always looking to improve on my flaws. It's true. It's great. Or just challenging yourself. We all yes. have flaws. If we did, here's the thing. We're like, why do I have all these things? I'm like, we are put on the planet. That is our job is to deal with our flaws, our childhood issues, our insecurities. Like. Couldn't we just look at it like our other job? Like, really? Mm. That's truly, if we didn't have, I don't even believe you. Like, I had a perfect childhood. Guess what? Something like, was missing. Something, something's yeah. up. And not, because, not in a negative way that I'm always looking for the downside. It's just, it's just kind of the reality. Mm-hmm. So anyway, thank you for bringing this to light. Your it. journey you. is going to be, is going to continue to be enlightening and inspiring for so many men and women. Lewis thank House, you. check him out. He's at Lewis House. Everywhere. Across the board. And this will all be on um, the podcast, on the website and all that. And thank you to my amazing team. I love you all. Yeah, team. Don't have a great team. Yes, here. team. 
Oh my God, they're so great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ken, Jamie, our intern, Shannon and Jenny, producer Larkin, Michael, and just thank you everyone for listening. I love you. Was it good for you? Email me, feedback at sexwithemily.com. 